On the afternoon of March 23rd, 2005, the BP Texas refinery was a billion-dollar machine fueled by oil and ambition. But for years, it had been running on a hidden fuel, complacency. That afternoon, a single toxic cloud escaping from a piece of equipment that should have been retired years ago found its spark. And the instant the cloud ignited, it did not just cause an explosion. It tore apart a corporate culture, killing 15 people and exposing a disaster that wasn't sudden, but was guaranteed. My name is Tim, and I help you become a better technician. And when you come to my class, I really try to make sure we fully understand the why of what we're learning. And so I'm working on some new safety content. And during my research, this one incident came up, and I really thought it was worth hitting the record button and sharing with you. The explosion that rocked Texas City wasn't a freak accident. It was a disaster years in the making. The BP refinery, one of the largest in the U.S., was plagued by deferred maintenance and aggressive cost savings. Gosh, if I haven't heard that a couple of times probably in the last week. Why does this keep happening? BP leadership unhealthily focused on personal injury rates, such as slips, trips, and falls, which, I mean, they are important. Often highlighting and proving those numbers as proof of the safety culture. But this focus masked the total disregard for process safety measurement. The measures necessary to prevent catastrophic chemical releases and explosions. Oh well, yeah, that, that does sound more important. They're both important. Internal audits and reports from the 1990s and early 2000s repetitively warned of the facility's deteriorating condition, outdated equipment, and insufficient training. The refinery had a history of fatalities averaging in one death every 16 months. This is in 2005. I mean, I think that would be absurd even in the 50s. Wow. These warnings were consistently ignored. Well, if you were having a death every 16 months, that probably would be so. The immediate timeline of the disaster centered on the isomerization, ISOM unit, and the raffinite splitter tower. Got to Google that one. Okay, so uh, that is the big tall thing, I guess. Hey, here's one for sale. But, um, <laughs> yeah, all right, so some chemical thingy is what we're going to call that. The operators... Attempting to start up, we're relying on instruments known to be defective. Boy, I mean, this is the same thing I hear when people come to a class. I mean, gosh, if I could just break people from using jumper wires. I mean, our industry we would be so much safer. Jumper wires, toggling, and forcing. Those probably cause more accidents and maybe more deaths than probably anything else. The primary liquid level indicator on the tower gave false readings. Crucially, multiple high-level alarms, the most critical defense against overfilling, were either out of order or disabled. This fed the endemic problem of alarm fatigue, which, yeah, I mean, alarm fatigue is a huge issue that we really I probably should do some videos on. To address, you know, just because you throw an alarm on an HMI screen does not mean you've done your job. If that operator walks up and there's always an alarm on that screen, they're going to start ignoring the alarm. That's that's just normal. Lacking accurate information and following flawed informal procedures, the operators continued to pump flammable hydrocarbons into the tower over four hours. The liquid level surged to a height of 135 feet beyond. It's safety operational limit. Wow, 135 feet beyond. Fully packing the tower with volatile fluid. All right, now, what exactly are we looking at here? I so I think I think this may be the actual refinery. I'm not totally sure about that, but okay, I, I could see that. I mean, that is a tall structure, but you pump, how do you pump that thing 135 feet beyond what you think about it without at least doing some type of check. And I guess maybe maybe a check is difficult on that, but if a check is difficult, then yeah, that's why we have sensors. And if, 
if those sensors could go bad, I mean, yeah, this is why we have redundancy. What speaking of which, that is what I was trying to research, is trying to explain the why of redundancy. Because when you come into my class, a lot of times it's like, yeah, there's just, you know, a relay after a relay after a relay. It just seems like a waste. But yeah, this this is exactly why. At approximately 1.14 p.m., the pressure forced the safety relief valves open. The mass of liquid and vapor was shunted to a blow-by drum. This piece of equipment and its short 11-foot atmospheric vent stack was an antique never upgraded to route material to the modern flare system. Okay, and I've seen the flare systems. That's kind of where they burn off stuff. Beyond <laughs> you know, that stuff is all I can tell you that, you know, is coming off the refinery. The drum was overwhelmed, and the excess material was vented directly into the air. A geyser of cold vaporized hydrocarbon sprayed out and pulled onto the ground, creating a massive invisible gas cloud. Well, I guess it was super cold. I guess it was heavier than air. Okay. The cloud drifted directly toward the unit's boundary. There, just 100 feet away from the dangerous event, stood a group of temporary contactor, contactor trailers. 100 foot away? That seems that seems really absurd. I mean, I, I mean, I, I've never really worked at large-scale oil refineries, but I've worked in hazardous environments, explosion-proof environments, classified environments, and... Um, Hey, you don't have a trailer within 100 feet of something like that. All 15 people who were killed were in or near these lightweight, unprotected structures. They were placed dangerously close, around 121 feet, to the hazardous unit, solely for the convenience of the contractors. The vapor cloud found an ignition source, most likely the engine of an idling diesel vehicle nearby. The resulting vapor cloud and explosion was enormous, felt for miles, and instantaneously obliterated the trailers. I guess this is the truck that they are thinking did it. I mean, yeah, I would even thought about a diesel truck doing it, but also I wouldn't have a diesel truck idling in a hazardous area, I don't think. But yeah, their fatalities were the contractor and staff. People like Oh, I don't like to mention people's names. But yeah, there's a couple that work there together. I really hate that. And young engineers whose careers were just beginning. And yeah, you know, these accidents, they're, they're not usually partial to your age. Their deaths were a direct result of corporate decisions. Survivors describe the scene as surreal. A moment of routine followed by an instant of blinding force. Many suffered burns and injuries buried under wreckage of trailers. The tragic irony was that these employees and contractors were the least protected, located in the highest risk area simply to save time and money on their commute into the facility. The sheer location of the trailers turned the process failure into a mass casualty event. The ensuing investigation by the U.S. Chemical Safety Board and the independent Baker panel did not point to the operator error as the root cause, but rather organizational and safety deficiencies at all levels of BP Corporation. And, you know, I, I have to, you know, it's not just, I'm not pointing out BP here. They, you know, a lot of corporations I go to, it, 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 in the end, even a lot of your operator areas, it is the corporate entity's responsibility to make sure that we're not using these informal guidelines. I, I never forget, I was at one facility and the operator, you know, he was mixing some fairly dangerous chemicals. And he's like, yeah, we crank this valve, valve at about 45 degrees. Count to about 30 seconds and then close it. That usually gets us through the day. And I'm like, no, 45 degrees. Is that, could that be 40 or 50? I mean, how do you know exactly 45? And of course, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know where 45 degrees is. Anytime anyone starts pointing out their years of experience, that's, that's usually that complacency. Those informal processes. Y'all do it by comments. Y'all start out, I'm an electrician. I've been doing this for 30 years. Let me tell you everything you did wrong in this video. It's like, you know, if you have one year's experience, you probably 
I, honestly, it, you know, if you're straight out of school, you can probably tell better. He could probably explain to me better what I'm doing wrong. BV was hit with the largest fine in OSHA history at the time, totaling hundreds of millions of dollars for hundreds of willful violations. The company paid over $2 billion in damages and settlements. The Baker Report, commissioned by BP itself, found the safety problems were endemic across BP's U.S. refineries, not unique to the Texas facility. The disaster led to major reforms across the industry. The American Petroleum Institute revised its recommended practices for trailer sitting, banning lightweight occupied structures and hazardous blast zones. I mean, I've been to a lot of facilities, even back then, there would have been a trailer there. There was also a greater focus on developing standards for process safety indicators and addressing work fatigue. The Texas City explosion exposed Karai Crows. You know, all the things they found in this report are great, but we're still addressing the same things today. I mean, I'm, I'm still having to research this to try to explain to y'all why we need this safety PLC. Something to think about. The Texas City explosion exposed the corrosive business model that placed cost reduction above human life. The tragedy forced the chemical industry to redefine safety, proving that until corporate leadership embeds process safety at its core, no facility is truly safe. And, you know, okay, the, the, this, this, what I'm reading is going really hard after the corporation. It does start there. But, you know, even once we get safety in place, I see so many of y'all come in here and just ride what y'all consider the lame procedures that safety makes you follow. Unfortunately, these explosions, these deaths, that's what causes us to have these lame, as y'all say, safety procedures. But that's just a thought for today. So that's a little heavier than my typical video, but I think this is important. And let me know in the comments, would you like to see more like this? How do we, how do we, and I don't want to turn it into a storytelling, you know, kind of glamorizing this, but how do we take these past incidents and help us understand why we need to do these things to implement a safety culture in our workplace? See you in the next video.